Hey, thanks for checking out our innovation podcast. Hopefully this gives you some encouragement for the rest of your week. Have you ever caught yourself doing something and literally in the moment you're going, I have no clue why I'm doing this? Has that ever happened to you before? Like, you think about it and you go, I would have never in my life imagined that I would ever, ever be doing this. You ever felt that way before? This week I had that experience. I was uh, at my house and my wife and I, you know, we have an almost 16 month old son and so we haven't gone on as many dates as we used to. We used to for the first almost 10 years or almost nine years of our marriage before we had our son. We used to go on dates every single week. Every single week we'd go out to dinner, we'd go to a movie, we'd do something, right? Even when we were like completely broke, we would do something. But then we had our son and we just kind of stopped. And so my wife asked me a couple weeks ago, she said, I'd really like to go on a date. And so I've just kind of remembered that. And so I've been looking for something fun to do. When the other night at my house on my computer, I scrolled across tickets for a concert by a band named Hanson. You guys know who Hanson is, right? Hanson's the band that has the single hit, Mbop, Tippy Top, A Do Wop, Dewey Dop, A Mbop, Tippy Top, A Do. That's from when I was like, I was a kid, right, when this song came out. But my wife was at that age where she was crushing hard on the Hansons, even when she wasn't sure if the youngest one was a boy or a girl, right? Because they were really young when they first came out. And so I'm sitting there and I'm looking at these tickets and the, the thing's sold out. So the prices are a little bit higher than they would have been if I would have known about it maybe two months ago. And, but I'm sitting there thinking like, okay, am I really about to spend money on Hanson tickets? And then am I going to drive to Cleveland, pay to park and stand in a concert venue for multiple hours listening to Hanson? And the answer was unequivocally yes. This is how you are going to spend hours of your life and you're also going to pay the money that it would take you hours upon hours to make to make this happen. And the reason is simple, because I love my wife, right? See, here's, here's the thing. When you have a relationship with someone, that relationship, as exciting as it is, it also comes with responsibility, right? In fact, I'll say it like this. All relationships come with responsibility. All relationships come with responsibility. Here's, here's how we know that's true. Um, because as a married man, guess what I do? I will do things for my wife and with my wife that I probably don't want to do on my own, right? Like you would never catch me as a 31 year old man asking my friends to say, hey, do you guys want to go see Hanson on Tuesday night? No. You want to know why? Because it's going to be like 99% girls. I might be the only guy there Tuesday night, right? Uh, you know, this is true too. All relationships come with responsibility. Like as a parent, when you have kids, immediately guess what happens? You're aware that it's no longer just about you, but you're responsible to raising your children. When you go to work every single day. Guess who you're responsible to? If you're an employee, you're responsible to your boss, right? You have a job you have to do. If you are a boss, guess what? You are still responsible to your employees and you might even be responsible to shareholders. You might be responsible to a board, but you're responsible, right? Because you have a relationship. If you're a student, you have a responsibility to your teachers, just like your teachers have a responsibility to you. Because once again, all relationships come with responsibility. And here's the other thing we know that we know that's true is that when you don't take that that responsibility seriously, it introduces this big nasty word that we don't like, and that's consequences. Consequences, right? So guess what? Uh, if you're in here and you're younger, or if you ever had parents at some point that you live with and they told you that you had chores to do and you did not do those chores, you did not take your responsibility seriously, guess what you experienced? consequences, right? If you did not do your homework and you never turned it in, like some of us might have done when we were in middle school and high school, right? That was me. I was a very mediocre student, not because I wasn't smart, but because I was super lazy. Guess what I experienced? Consequences. If you do not, as a husband or a wife, date your spouse, love your spouse, support your spouse, guess what happens? In your marriage, you experience consequences. Every single relationship comes with responsibility. And every time we don't take the responsibility seriously, there are always cons consequences. They might be different depending on the situation, but there are always every single time consequences when we do not take the responsibility seriously. Now that's true of all of our relationships. When you leave here today, that's going to be true of the ones at your home. That's going to be true of the ones on your street. That's going to be true of the ones at work, maybe tonight or tomorrow, wherever you go, that's true. But this is also incredibly true of our relationship with Jesus, that our relationship with Jesus comes with responsibility. 
In fact, here, here's what I want you to know is that when you got saved, when you decided to become a follower of Jesus Christ, your responsibility became that your life was no longer about just you. Your life now is wrapped up in something bigger than yourself, which means you're going to love Jesus and you're going to love people the way that Jesus loved people, which is to say you're going to love them sacrificially. Right? And guess what? That responsibility that you have also has consequences if it is not lived out. And those consequences might not be something you experience now, and they might not even just be consequences for you yourself, but those consequences might affect people that you know and love, and even people that you haven't met yet. Here's why. It's because there might be people that are in your life now that will never experience the love of God apart from you sharing it with them. There are people in your life now that will never grow into a committed relationship with Jesus if you don't take it seriously. There are some things that will never change simply because you and I don't always take the responsibility of a relationship with Jesus seriously. Like, if you read the book of Acts, right, like we're in this series looking at the book of Acts and we're wrapping it up today, kind of putting a pause on it. This will be a series we kind of hit from time to time just to keep going back to why we're here and what God has for us. But if you read the book of Acts, you see, like we saw last week, for those of you who were here, I mean, that in one day, 3,000 people are added to the church. One day. And that is not something that just happens in Acts chapter 2. We see things like that happening all through the book of Acts. And do you know why that happened in the book of Acts and it doesn't necessarily happen today? Because then you had people taking very seriously the responsibility of their relationship with Jesus Christ. And for us, if I can just be honest, here's what happens in our culture many times. Is our culture tells us from a very young age, there's two things you don't talk about. You don't talk about politics. You can tweet about it apparently. But you don't talk about it, and you don't talk about religion. And so we've grown up hearing, don't talk about it, don't bring it up. But here's what you need to know. If we don't talk about it, if we don't bring it up, nothing ever changes. In fact, we see right on the heels of 3,000 people being added to the church, we see in Acts chapter 3, two of Jesus' disciples, Peter and John, having an opportunity to do something incredible. So if you've got a Bible with you this morning, uh, we're going to be for the next few minutes in Acts chapter 3. We're going to read about 10 verses together that we're going to go through, and then we're going to jump to another spot. While you're turning there, once again, just want to remind you, we're in a series called We're Here to Change the World, because what we're learning is this, is that, man, God's plan for our life is nothing short of Him using us to change the world, that we have this relationship with Jesus, but once again, that relationship comes with a responsibility. And so today, really the question we're going to answer is, what is our responsibility? Like, what should we be doing? Because once again, if we don't do this, if we don't take it seriously, you're going to spend the rest of your life experiencing the consequences of that. You're going to have children who run away from the faith. We're going to have friends in our life who were on fire for God, and then all of a sudden everything falls apart, and it's like a house of cards. Everything comes crumbling down. Because if we don't take it seriously, nobody else is going to. Every relationship relationship comes with a responsibility, and that responsibility is something we're going to see here in Acts chapter 3. So we're right on the heels. 3,000 people are just added to the church. We don't know if this is a day later, a couple days later, but here's what we see. Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 1, says, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Here's all you need to know about that. That means that out of the many prayer meetings offered that day, out of all the church services they could go to, they decided they were going to walk to prayer service about 3 in the afternoon. So they're headed there, and here's what they see. It says, a man, verse 2, lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering into the temple. So here's here's what you need to understand. There's this guy who every single day, as long as he was old enough to ask for money, as long as old, as long as he was old enough to beg and ask for things, his family or friends would carry him out, lay him on the ground outside this gate called the beautiful gate. And so every single day, here's, I want you to put yourself in his, from his perspective for a second. Every single day, he is laying on the ground, and there are people walking by ignoring him, acting as if he doesn't even exist, right? Here's how I know that's true. We do that with homeless people all the time, 
Right? Like you will pretend all of a sudden that there's a, an urgent message on your phone because how, like, God forbid we make eye contact at the stoplight, right? Like they might hurt us, right? So this guy every single day gets ignored. People are walking by. Every once in a while, somebody might talk to him. Every once in a while, somebody might help him out. Every once in a while, somebody might treat him like a human being. But most of the day, he's being ignored. And by the way, because they're not dealing with a lot of concrete back then, he's laying on the dirt and he's having dirt from people's sandals kicked up all over him all day. This guy's literally as low as you can get. So he sees Peter and John, right? This is what we see here. Verse three, right? He sees Peter and John about to go to the temple and he asked to receive alms. In other words, he's asking once again, can you help me out? They're not the first people that he's asked that day, right? He's probably been ignored dozens of times already. He's just saying at this point, like, hey, can you spare some change? Here, can you spare some change? Hey, can you help me out? Right? I need work. Whatever it might be. Like, it's just normal for them. It's just normal for us. And everybody keeps walking by. And he sees Peter and John, these two disciples. And he says, hey, can you help me out? In verse 4, everything changes. Everything gets different. Because here's what it says. It says, and Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. In other words, guess what they did? The greatest thing that Peter and John did, and one of the greatest things we can do, is simply notice hurting people. Notice them. Have you ever thought about that? Like, how many people do you walk by every single day that are in pain? Emotionally tormented physically hurting, spiritually lost. Every single day we walk by these people. But what Peter and John did is exactly what you and I need to do. We need to slow down long enough to notice the hurting people around us. Because can I tell you, the reason that many people think in the world that the church at large does not care about people is because we are so busy doing our own thing that we don't notice the stuff that's going on right around us. We don't care if our cities are on fire as long as our churches are full. And that's ridiculous. They stop long enough to look at this man and they look at him and they say, look at us. In other words, we see you. We notice you. We're paying attention to you. You know how much could change if we just simply took that, if we did nothing else, but we took that approach to the world around us. My goodness, how Akron could be different. My goodness, how our neighborhood could be changed. Simply because somebody stopped and looked and said, I see you, now look at us. But it doesn't just stop there because the man, then it says verse 5, fixes his attention on them because he's expecting to receive something from them. But he's about to hear something that no one who wants a gift ever wants to hear. Peter responds, he says in verse 6, I have no silver and gold. In other words, what you wanted, you're not going to get. Right? I wonder for a moment if this man who was asking for things would have almost automatically begun to shift his eyes away. But Peter just keeps talking. He says, I have no silver or gold for you, but what I do have, I give to you. And he makes this incredibly bold statement. He says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, if you've read the Bible, that doesn't sound strange to you, right? Because you've read about Jesus before, and you see Jesus heal people, you see his disciples heal people, so that doesn't seem off. But can you imagine for a second that you're this person who's been lame from birth, laying on the ground, covered in dirt, asking for things every single day, and somebody looks at you and says, get up on your feet. Like, that doesn't register with you. It's not like he's injured. He's never walked before. But he's told, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Now, many of us, here's what we would do. We'd say, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And then we'd step back and wait for something to happen. But check out what Peter does. It says here in the very next verse, that and, so right after this, he, being Peter, took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately, his feet and ankles were made strong. Now, I could be wrong, but you know how I read this? That he told him to get up and walk. But the healing didn't happen until he reached out his hand. Because he said it, but notice, nothing happened until Peter grabbed the guy by the hand and helped him up. Do you know why that is? I think this is insane. Like, this just, this blows my mind all the time. Like, it, it, it literally is insanity to me that you have this great, big, perfect God with this incredibly perfect plan, and he chooses, for whatever reason, in his infinite wisdom that I will never fully know on this side of eternity, he chooses to use messed up, imperfect people to accomplish his perfect plan. 
That's it. You see it all through the scriptures where God could do it on his own, and yet he decides, no, I'm going to do this with people. I don't get it. I don't understand why. But here's what I know, is there are some things that you and I want to see God do, but he will not do them until you and I decide to participate. I fully believe, I could be wrong, you can call me out on it, send me an email this week, that's fine. I fully believe if they had said, get up and walk, and then walked away, that man lays there. Because do you think he's even going to try? I mean, how many people have tried telling him, like, hey, you just got to have faith. If you just try it, it'll probably work. It took the participation of people who said they loved Jesus and who said they had faith in Jesus. It actually took them extending their faith through the form of their hand to help him up before anything would change. Immediately, this guy's life is completely doing a 180. It couldn't be any different in this moment than it was the moment before. Because now he's taken by the hand, he's up, and what we read in these next few verses is this, is that he is up and he's jumping and leaping and he goes into the temple, jumping and leaping, and he's praising God in the temple and everyone in the temple is looking at this man and they're realizing that this is the same man that we have walked by multiple times a day on the way to church. And now he's in church and everything's changed. Here's what I really love about this account is this shows us what church is all about. Church is not all about coming in here on Sunday morning. That's part of it, but that's not the whole thing. Notice in Acts 3, man, church, where church happened that day was on the way to church. It happened just outside the parking lot to church. It happened out in the real world, out in the marketplace, out where the people were that day. Man, if we have this small picture of what church is, that church is only what happens in here on Sunday morning, and hear me, what happens in here is important, and you should be inviting people. You should be bringing people. This is absolutely a great opportunity for people to come to know Jesus. I think, it's, I think the local church is the hope of the world, but I don't think the local church is the hope of the world only when the building where they meet for church. It's when that church understands their responsibility and takes it seriously. Because all relationships come with responsibility, and that responsibility for us comes down to one word. And that word is reconciliation. Reconciliation. I know that's kind of a big word. You, you can look at the screen and write it out, right? If you're taking notes, that's okay. You can even misspell it. Nobody's going to know. They're your notes, right? But all relationships come with responsibility, and that responsibility for us comes down to one word. That one word is reconciliation. In fact, the way that Paul writes it is he said it's a ministry of reconciliation. So maybe you're not quite sure what it means to have a ministry, but here's really all ministry is, is ministry is deciding to partner with God to see things happen, to serve Him and see things happen. So that means when you, if you're here and you've ever served back with our kids, that's a ministry you're involved in. If you do like what Ronnie does week in and week out and you're running sound or you're doing slides or you're up here like Emily and the team and you're leading worship or you're up at the doors or you're loading in or you're loading out after service, that's a ministry you are involved in. So all of us have like different preferences, but every single one of us have the same responsibility and that's the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, that means like we said earlier, that when you become a follower of Jesus, your life is no longer about yourself but your life is now wrapped up in something bigger than yourself. And that means you're not just going to love Jesus and you're not just going to go to the worship concerts and buy the CDs and get all the goosebumps and feel all the feels, but you're going to get into the nitty gritty of life and you're going to love people sacrificially enough that you're going to serve them outside of these walls. You're going to do everything you can to get them into a relationship with Jesus wherever they are and wherever they find themselves on the spectrum of faith. You're going to do your best to take seriously your responsibility, which is reconciliation. And so just to clear up this ministry, ministry of reconciliation. Once again, if you've got a Bible, um, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 here for about six verses, not a whole lot. If you, once again, if you don't want to turn there, if you're not sure where that is, it'll be up on the screen. But there's nowhere in the scriptures that I think paints our responsibility more clearly than 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul is writing a letter to, the church, to a church in a city called Corinth, and this church is messed up. Up. In fact, if you read the book of 1 Corinthians, you're going to read things, if you've never read it before, that you are surprised are in the Bible, right? Because there's, like, even the weirdest possible thing in there, he's having to address incest in the church. 
That's weird, right? Like that doesn't happen unless maybe you're in West Virginia or some weird parts of Kentucky, right? That's me throwing shade. That's okay. We're in Akron, Ohio. But here's the deal. Wherever you are, that's still strange, right? And so he's writing this letter. Now, this is his second letter. It's kind of a follow-up, and he's still addressing the church. And in that, he addresses our responsibility. And so here's what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting here in verse 14. He says this, for the love of Christ controls us. Automatically, we could stop there, we could end there, we could drop the mic and we'd be done and it would be fine. Because here's what that tells us, is that it's the love of God, not the guilt of God, not the burden of God, not the hate of God. It's the love of Christ, the love of Jesus that controls our lives. In other words, it's the love of Jesus that dictates everything we do in our lives. It's the love of Jesus that compels us to not just live for ourselves, but to live for other people. It's the love of Jesus that changes everything. Because here's what you know, the love of Jesus is what's changed your life and it's our job to share that love because ultimately here's what a lot of people have done is they experience the love of Jesus but then they want everybody else to follow the rules and they think that's how they're going to experience God is they've got to act right that couldn't be further from the truth our job is not just to experience the love but also to share the love of Jesus he says the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this in other words after all of our living all of our discussion all of our study here's what we've come down to is that one has died for all therefore all have died and he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves but for him who for their sake died and was raised in other words let's just package that up real quick that means if you're a follower of Jesus your new mantra is it's not about me. That's it. I don't live for myself. I live for Jesus. And because I live for Jesus, I love people like Jesus did, which is to say, I love people sacrificially. It's not about me. Verse 16, he gets really practical, right? This is what he says. He says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ that way. Here's what that means, is that when we see people, we don't regard them according to the flesh, which means I don't look at them and see their reputation. I don't look at them and see their accomplishments. I don't look at them and see their failures. I don't look at them and see their baggage. I look at people, and I am supposed to see people the way that Jesus sees people. I don't regard them according to the flesh, so I don't look at them and ascribe value to them the way that everyone else does. Right? Because let's, let's be real. When you go somewhere, automatically what many people do is they look around the room and they kind of size the room up, right? They figure out, well, who should I hang out with? Who should I avoid? Who should I be with? Who's going to drag me down? And we go into a room and it's all about us. What Paul says is when we go into a room on a street, we go into the market or we show up at church, it's not about me. I don't see people that way anymore. We regard no one according to the flesh. Therefore, verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And then here's what he, how he finishes it up. He says, all of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us us. Man, if you are a person who underlines in your Bible or highlight, that's what I'd be highlighting right there. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Here's what makes that so important. He didn't give it to someone else. He didn't give this ministry to just a few other people. He didn't say, this is going to be for the people who specialize in evangelism, right? That's what we call it a lot of times in the church. This is for those people. No, he's saying he gave us, he wrote this to an entire church filled with all sorts of people, good people, bad people, messy people, imperfect people, self-righteous people. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. It's for all of us. So if you're a part of the church, the Big C Church, this is not like your optional thing like, well, maybe I'll sign up for reconciliation just like I might serve in kids. No, this is for all of us. No one is exempt. Verse 19, he explains that a little bit. He says, here's the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. In other words, bringing the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. So how does God change the world? Through us. How does God bring hope into the world now? Through us. How does God make a difference in the world? Through us. Which, guess what that means? If we don't like the world we see, it is not the world's fault. It is our fault. 
Because all relationships come with responsibility, and that responsibility for us is reconciliation. I've been a part of a lot of places and a lot of groups and a lot of churches, and I hear a lot of pastors who they just want to point the fingers at everything around them and say, man, the world is so corrupt, the world is so bad. Okay, awesome. It doesn't take a leader to point out a problem. Right? The church isn't supposed to just call out and say, hey, that's what darkness looks like. Avoid it. Jesus says that we are the light of the world. That means we take that light with us wherever we go. That means if you go to work tomorrow and your workplace is still as dark and hopeless as it was on Friday, that's not your job's fault. That might just be your fault. If you go into your vocation or you go into your school and you go, well, this stinks. I don't like it. It's never going to be different. My question will be, what are you doing to make it different? Who are you bringing with you? What's happening to make that change? Because once again, all relationships come with responsibility. That responsibility for us is reconciliation. Are we taking that responsibility seriously? Because here's what I want you to imagine for a second as I have Emily come up and Kati come up. Here's what I want you to imagine. What if just us here in this room took our responsibility more seriously? Not everybody else. Let's not look at everybody else and point the finger. Us. What if just us in this room? What if we took our responsibility seriously? What if we decided that when we left this place, we weren't just going to live life as is and the way we've done it, but we decided we were going to actively be a part of seeing the world brought closer to Jesus? What if we decided that I'm willing to be uncomfortable for a few moments to invite somebody to church because that just might change everything for them? What if we decided that I'm not just going to give in to my kid wanting to be lazy, but I'm going to actually have a conversation with them even though they don't want to talk to me? What if we decided that we were going to disciple our families instead of just letting our families live under our, our roofs? What if we decided we were going to take our marriage responsibility more seriously? And men, we decided we were going to pastor our wives and not just 